Hey you, I'm Andy Powell. Welcome to the AllCast Podcast. No topic is off the table. I hope you enjoy. All right, today's episode is going to be with Cody Drake, Arizona treasure hunter. He's been hunting treasure in all different places all over Arizona for a long time, off of horseback, on foot, in all different ways. He does a lot of research, and he uh, joined me today to sit down and, and um, answer some questions and tell us about his, his journey. Welcome, Cody. Thank you, Andrew. It's yeah, a man. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for uh, making the drive. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we were talking before I started recording that you were in the military. Yeah, I was. Yeah. And you were, um, you said you were in eleven Bravo, which is infantry. For those that don't know, that is right. And you were in for six years active, mm -hmm. four years active reserve. Is it already um, reserve? Uh, I active was reserve, never mind. Inactive ready reserve. Inactive ready. Okay. Yeah. Because when you join the military, even if you sign up for three years, 16 weeks, or four years, you are obliged to an eight-year contract. So when you get out, you still are a part of that inactive ready reserve. And they might muster you up for like a drill for maybe over the summer or something like that. But um, yeah, it was... Uh, I got out because um, in the middle of my career because my father was passing away and I was there with them at the end and I helped my mother out. And then when all the affairs were in order and it, all that drama as regularly happens with funerals and you get family members coming out of the woodwork scavenging for like, what's mine? What can I get? And stuff like that. Man. Um, once all that drama was settled, um, I went back into the military and then I was at Fort Hood for three years when I did a presentation at a little small town in texas called salado where i have a lot of history there and i pulled up over four thousand artifacts um, from the town's history and i've had more artifacts on display in the museum than the museum had on display for the entire town wow and uh donated everything to the town that led to me being on the discovery channel for a treasure hunting and survival guide and then that led me to be sponsored and in magazines and other television show appearances documentaries and here we are what was that like being on tv and stuff oh it was so much fun was it yeah <laughs> you get a lot of attention from like random strangers and stuff sometimes um mostly from the presentations i've done at like breweries and clubs like prospecting clubs treasure hunting clubs and stuff like that that's where a lot of the um strange encounters happened but being on TV, I didn't get that many that many creepers. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So you'll set up an event at a brewery or something, and then people, they'll advertise the event. People will know, hey, that guy's going to be there. Yes. And then they'll come out and see you. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So what do you talk about when you when you do these events? Well, I have treasures on display, artifacts, um, relics of the past that I've uncovered as surface finds or metal detecting. And I'll talk about the history of that land, the history of the artifacts, how they got there. Um and then the connection with those artifacts to those events in history and try to share my passion of treasure hunting, history recovery, so that way people can kind of get off the couch and get out there into the wilderness, seek out their own adventures, because it's my opinion that there's more artifacts under the earth right now that are on display in museums throughout the world. Yeah, I bet. And <clears throat> yeah, you take people out and do different types of excursions they'll pay you to show them how to treasure hunt over this like two or three day type of thing, right? That's correct. Um, I'm a hired treasure hunting and survival guide. So I'll take people out into like the Bradshaw mountains, kind of like where we are right now and um, teach them how to metal detect, how to prospect for gold, how the old timers did it. Not only how the Spanish conquistadors did it, but the early American prospectors, um, Mexican miners, they all had the same methodical practices, though some of, what they did was just slightly different, but mm. I'll teach you how to do that, set you up for success, and teach you that the greatest key to success is actually um, your own mental state because people psych themselves out very early on. They get frustrated, then they quit, and I'll help you push through that because it's, once you realize you are your biggest asset, like your mental state is your biggest asset, um, success is just right around the corner. That's awesome. Yeah. What are some of the artifacts that you'll take to these gatherings, these events at breweries and such? I actually brought a couple for you. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. Awesome. So these were found in the... This was a cattle ranch that I was treasure hunting on. I, I had planned to be there for five days. 
This was in 2005. Around the 20th of July, 2005, I knew the cattle rancher from earlier on, and he said that he wasn't going to be using this part of his range until the spring, so he said I could be out there as long as I wanted to, and I said five days, and he's like, nah, if you want to stay longer, stay longer, and he, he said it very clearly a few times, and I camped the first night. And on the morning of the second day, I was tre treasure hunting, like metal detecting with a Tesoro Lobo metal detector. And I found some unrecognizable iron things um, that were about a foot down. And then I found that big coin right there, and it was solid black. All those coins were solid black. And that big coin was the first one I found. And you could read King Carlos III. You could read 1794 on it. And... I was so ecstatic. I, I, I remember just sitting down in silence for an hour, just holding it and looking around the area and just envisioning the history of how that coin might have gotten there and who held it last. And it was the thought of being the first person to touch that since maybe 1794 linked me to the person who dropped that. Whoa. And it got me a new, like it, I just created a new high in a way. Like, I'm just like, this is incredible. And I started to pack up and leave because I'm like, I found a Spanish coin. And I got 100 yards down creek, about to turn up a canyon. And I stopped and realized, well, what if there's more? Yeah. And I turned around, <laughs> came back, and I found over a thousand artifacts. There was, well, there was, you know, a thousand coins total. And there was 50 silver coins. And, well, 30 silver coins. There was, 50 that were kind of sort that they're like crudely made and then the rest were copper per coins three gold coins and all the coins were in a line from the, the campsite that the spanish had to the riverbed and then they crossed the riverbed up the opposite bank and then up the adjacent hill and then all the coins stopped at the top of the hill and that's where i found that the gold coins and gold's heavier than silver uh, it's 19 times heavier than water 10 times heavier than gravel that it's associated with and just like native american pottery that's a thousand years old some of it's laying on top of the ground and the gold coins were no different pieces of them were sticking up out of the ground and i found them with the metal detector then i looked down i could see pieces of them sticking up and they were all found in the same square foot three gold coins um, one was 1767 one was 1768 and then one was 1789 and just about 12 feet away was a Snickers bar wrapper and a shotgun shell. So some hunter had stepped over them and wow. had a snack and never even knew that they were there. So that predates this country. It does. That's wild. So this yeah. coin I'm holding in my hand, is this solid silver? That's silver. It was probably mined in Zacatecas, Mexico by native labor. And then it was minted in Mexico City and then sent north to San Augustine de Tucson, which is now what we call Tucson. It was the northernmost Spanish Presidio, which is a fortified church in a way, kind of like the Alamo. Mm. And that was the northernmost settlement of Sonora, which was the boundary of New Spain. This was called like Fronteras. This is this was the frontier. Um, they actually called it Pimaria Alta. That's what we, we're living in northern Pimaria Alta, going from Tucson to the northern boundary. This was all the frontier country. Yeah. And St. Augustine to Tucson led four punitive military expeditions into the Pinel Mountains to destroy a group of Apaches that no longer exist. They're called the Pinaleros, and they spearheaded every single raid that hit Spanish Tucson. It was nearly 200 raids that hit San Javier, Tubac, and the Presidio itself. Um, and then I believe what I found was an encampment of a detachment of soldiers who got themselves in a nice defensive area, which if you're not really in a threat, it's a really cool place. It's in a tributary of three canyons and I found flattened musket balls on the ridgeline above and broken flint points in the sandbar where I found the coins so they were shooting up at those shooting down at them wow <laughs> yeah it's crazy and you were by yourself when you found this right by myself yeah that's that was pretty cool because you, you really have that stillness to be able to feel into what the story could have been and, and kind of piece things together in that way yeah so this coin that I'm holding here is probably an inch and a half inch and three quarters across it's silver. It says Hispan et ind rex. And then it has an M8RFM. 
I don't know what all that means. That's on one side. And then the image on that side, there's a crown uh, and two pillars with what looks like um, a crest, which looks like a crest, uh, a shield crest. So there's um, in opposing corners, there's two of the griffins or lions standing up. And then the opposite opposing corners look like a uh, three spired castle. Same image in each. And I can't see uh, the smaller piece in the middle. Then on the other side, it looks like um, like what you would expect somebody to look like in the Founding Fathers era. They've got the the wig type thing on, and they got the funny nose and stuff like that. It says 1794, Carolus IV. And you said that was the name of a king? Yeah, it's King Carlos III. Carlos. He's the one, he's the one king responsible of expelling the Jesuit priests from the New World. He was the guy. And where where did he reign? He was in, well, he was the king of Spain, and he wanted to consolidate his power, but the Jesuits had a lot of impunity because they only answered to the Pope. Well, he wanted the the religious order to answer only to him. And so what he did was he gathered up, this was secret. Like, this was kind of like, you know, the Tet Offensive in 1968. Like, this was so secret. He wanted all of the Jesuits of the New World to be arrested without any any word or any warning sent back to Spain and he was going to replace them with the Franciscan friars, which answered to the king. Hmm. Um, he would have more control over what they were doing. Now, a lot of people think that there's a lot of Jesuit treasure out there and there probably is, but it was mostly to consolidate power, you know, to bring in more revenue. Hmm. So, um, but that happened in 1767 that's when the Jesuits were expelled from the New World, and then they were replaced by the Franciscan Order. Wow. And that's the first coin. That's the biggest. And you found all four of these in the same area? Same area. area? Yeah. Same okay. Area. And you said that they were kind of going in a line up a hill. Mm -hmm. What do you suppose happened there? You have a mouse chew through their treasure box? I think because um, of the, the violent clues that I found, I, I did find it was a couple Escobetas, which is like an old flintlock musket. Um, they're kind of shorter. The buttstock is a little curved, so it's not going to be comfortably sitting in the crest of your shoulder. Um, it's mostly just like a handheld. I found a couple of broken those. I found a broken, it's a, called that Espada Ancha, and it's like a, a wide sword. And I found that bent. And the musket balls on the ridge line and the flint points down below. The flint points were actually found in three clusters. So I think the men were grouped together in panic. And I think someone or something maybe an animal was running and they dropped the coins and then maybe something happened at the top of the hill the coins ran out there's nothing left to fall out out of someone's pocket or a saddlebag something um because during this time during the 1700s in let's say colonial spain and what's now arizona and tucson they really didn't have a lot of silver money it was a barter society they were mm. trading for everything the mission system had their own economy they would make candles they would make their own leather clothes from because um the presidios had their own ranches the miners had their own ranches the ranchers themselves did a lot of ranching those the vaqueros and then the mission system had their own ranches and they would trade with the miners they would trade with the soldiers and so everything was done through barter and a lot of the mining stuff would go to a bay and this was just hard rock it would go to a bay and then from a bay which was the capital of sonora at the time it would then travel to Zacatecas or Mexico City for refinement and then made into actual currency. That's awesome. So the second coin, uh, this one is very thin. It's like, I don't know how to describe it. Maybe like a few sheets of construction paper or some cardstock or something. It's an extremely thin silver coin. I can't really see exactly what's on it except those same lions and the, uh, the castle. This one says 1723 yeah. on it. So what do you know about this one? So all the, the lions and the castles refers to the king and queen of Spain. It's Castile and Leon. And so after the Reconquista, which um, was the occupation of 700 years of Moorish rule in Spain, this was, um, I believe it was 1491 or 1492 that they finally pushed out the last Moor occupants in Spain and then Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he discovered Hispaniola and then San Salvador and then um, Cuba was settled and then Hernan Cortez went to Mexico, conquered the Aztecs and then 
His cousin, Francisco Pizarro, went down to South America, conquered the Incas, and then Coronado went up into the Southwest in 1540. And like everything happened there. But um, Castile and Leon is the two kingdoms which were the monarchs of Spain for quite a long time. Wow. Those, yeah, those are the two kingdoms. Yeah. And do you know about how long they were kingdoms for? More than 100 years? More than, sounded like more than a few yeah. hundred years? Yeah, I would kind of call them provinces of Spain, which held dominant power during the Reconquista. Um, but the two pillars are the pillars of Hercules going into the Mediterranean Sea. And then um, around those pillars would have been kind of like a, like a scroll, and it would say plus unum. And it just means more beyond because they're exploring the sea. They're exp- like, this was after Columbus. And so there's more beyond the pillars that's, of Hercules. That's awesome. You can yeah. see those scrolls around the pillars on the larger coin. Definitely not the, the medium sized one. So this next one is, is the same thickness, but it's about the diameter of a dime. It's real, real small, real thin. So I'm assuming mm-hmm. that's just another, a smaller version of value that they would exchange with. Yeah. And then the last coin here is about the same size as that other medium one, which it basically is all the same imagery on it as the largest coin. So have you weighed these? You know what they weigh roughly? The larger one weighs about 22 um, grams, which would have been about an ounce of silver back then. But over time, it'll start to deteriorate, lose some weight. The large one is an eight real coin. And, you know, like parts of the Caribbean... They call them pieces of eight. Yeah. You know, it takes eight reals to make a silver peso. And that's a silver peso in your hand right there. That's what that means. The smallest one is a half real. The larger ones, like they're, they're the size of quarters. Those are two real coins. So those are all pieces of one eight real peso. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Okay, cool. Well, that's good stuff. So how often do you do those brewery meetups or any kind of events like that? Or was that kind of something in the past? It was something I did regularly in the past, um, once or twice a month for going on three years. Um, it, the I'm partnered with Bonehouse Brewery in Fountain Hills, Arizona, off of Shea Boulevard. A lot of the artifacts I've found are on display at the brewery. And the brewery is um, based off of the lure of Jacob Waltz and the Lost Dutchman Mine. So me being a treasure hunter and I actually recover artifacts of the past, um, and put them on display, it marries very well with the brewery's um, prerogative. So they have a lot of uh, skulls and skeletons in the brewery, and it's a fun game to figure out which ones are manufactured and which ones are real human bones. It's, That's it's awesome. I've actually I've been in there once. I, I work on trucks, and I had a, a road club. I do mobile truck stuff, and I, so I had to go out to that place. They had some guy couldn't get his lift gate up in that parking lot. Mm-hmm. So I got to go inside there and check it out. Pretty interesting spot. As far as these coins go, I'm sure you've got pictures on your Instagram. Oh, tons. Uh, what's your Instagram handle? It's the Arizona Treasure Hunter. Yeah, and it's a picture of you on your Spanish Mustang, which is not a car. It is a horse. Yes. Um, but I'm going to put some pictures of these coins in the show notes as well, just so that people can see and a link to your, your other stuff. So that's awesome. pretty awesome. Well, let me give these coins back to you so I don't damage <laughs> them or anything, and then we can... Yeah, the the larger one I, I keep on me every single day because it's my lucky coin because it it reminds me to never second guess myself because I almost left. Yeah. And I if I had left, I never would have found what I had found. That's awesome. Yeah. The Lost Dutchman is an interesting one. I'm sure you probably know more about that than me. I did a little bit of a report on that when I was in, uh, I don't know, seventh or eighth grade. And it was pretty cool because I tried to go out there to Weaver's Needle and and look at these different uh, clues that are supposed to indicate, you know, where the treasure is buried. Mm-hmm. Now, now that, unless the guy's lying, it's a real treasure that still has yet to be found, right? That is correct, yeah. And um, how much have you looked into that? Quite extensively. Um, of course, what, I, what I'm most passionate about and what I dive into the most is the rabbit holes involving Spanish colonialization, military conquest of the New World, and then military exploitation of the New World, and how they went about doing those very things. So I read a lot of Castilian Spanish documents. I read a lot of books that were written back then that are reprinted today. And I, if they can't be translated into English, I'll spend a lot of time translating them into English so I could understand what they really did. Now, the Lost Dutchman mine, um, 
is a rabbit hole in itself because you have Jacob Waltz, the Lost Dutchman, you have the Peralta Massacre, the Gonzales Massacre, and the Peralta Mines, you have the Peralta Stones, you have the, um, what was it, the Cooley Expedition going into the Superstition Mountains, who was hunting after the Lost Doc Thorne Mine, who was, ta- Dr. Thorne was a doctor out of Fort McDowell, and he was captured by the Apaches, who um, actually gave him a lot of respect because he helped the Apaches in the past. And they brought him um, as a gift to him. They blindfolded him, put him on horseback from their stronghold, and led him an entire day into a certain area of some mountain. He took off the blindfold when they said it's okay, and he could see a stone corral. He could see a peak, which looked like a Mexican sombrero at the time. And he could see a pile of gold-bearing quartz on the ground, and the Apaches told him, take as much as you can carry. And he took off his jacket. He tied off the the wrists and he filled up the arms with the gold bearing quartz. And then he took off his pants, tied off the ankles and he put them over the saddle and he filled up the legs with gold bearing quartz. And the Apaches made fun of him because they said it looked like half a man riding the horse. Hmm. Um, And when he went back to Fort McDowell, the Apaches said goodbye and wished him well. And then he bankrupted his family trying to find where that spot was. Wow. And when he was in New Mexico, he ran into an individual named Corrigan Cooley who financed his own military expedition to go into the Superstition Mountains, the Four Peaks region, the Mazatzal Mountains, and then Sierra Ancha Mountains to hunt for Dr. Thorne's mine. And one of the members of the Cooley expedition was Jacob Waltz. And so um, Cooley's expedition didn't find a lot of mineral wealth. They had a lot of hints and tips to things. You'll find gold in every mountain range in Arizona. That's a guarantee. But the amount of gold that they were looking for was not found. And so when they went back to Fort McDowell and disbanded, one person re-outfitted to go back into the mountains alone, and that was Jacob Waltz, and then the rest is history. Hmm. Yeah. So nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows where it's at, but it's there. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're getting gold-bearing quartz, that I'm sure it varies in the amount of gold that's in that quartz, because you can go find quartz all over the place that doesn't have gold in it. So do you know, do the stories tell of, of like how much gold... Like, could you visibly see the gold in these chunks of quartz? You can. There's a, there's an individual in Apache Junction who owns what is rumored to be the actual gold from the Lost Dutchman mine. Um, when Jacob Waltz died, he had a candle box underneath his bed with 40 pounds of gold-bearing ore in that candle box. And what's left of that is in the possession of one individual. It's a ring that has the gold-bearing quartz inlaid in the ring, and then there's a the matchbox. And it's supposed to be about, the mine is supposed to be appraised at $300 million. And this was like in the 1990s when I first heard about it. So basically every two and a half feet, you're a millionaire. Wow. Yeah. So if, if it's a load bear, the thing is, if you find the Lost Dutchman mine, there are laws and regulations. There's a treasure trove law. So if you're in the superstition mountains and you find remnants of like gold coins or silver coins, it's much different than finding it like what I did on private property with permission of the landowner. Um, because I had permission of the landowner, no local, state, or federal agency has any say in what I do. No permits were needed. It was just a deal struck between me and the landowner, and we split everything 50-50. Hmm. But if you find this in the Superstition Mountains, which is a wilderness area, and it's closed off to mining and treasure hunting, you can do some things, but you can't like dig extensively. But if you find treasure like coins or, or bars of silver... You can file what's called a treasure trove permit, and you can legally excavate that treasure. And I believe it's like a 60-40 deal with the Arizona state government. Go figure. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to file for it, and they give it to you? You don't have to have it approved or convince them or anything? You do have to have it approved. And I've inquired about the treasure trove permit a few times, and the Forest Service is who you have to go through to obtain the treasure trove permit. And they're actually more than willing to help you if you can provide tangible evidence that that is a real treasure you found. It exists, and it's not a bunch of hokum and lore, which is what they get a crap load of. Well, that's kind of a catch-22 because you can't prove it unless you dig for it and find it to prove it, right? The only way you could really prove it nowadays is if you were to take video and photos at the scene and then go back later and then tell them, this is what I found, here's the video evidence of it, I'm hoping you don't screw me over, and I would like to have a treasure trove permit. And I think it's like between twelve dollars and $20,000. You do it through the most miserable months of the year, which is like July and August. And you have to have a... That's the cost of the permit? Uh-huh. 
Whoa. And you have to provide all the labor yourself. And this is prior to finding out the value of the treasure you're looking for. That's right. That's risky. Yeah. Wow. And, um, I mean, it could be cheaper, I guess. But for sure, it could be cheap. From what I've heard, it's not very cheap. And it takes a while to get it approved. And then a mine inspector is going to come out from OSHA or something like that to make sure that you're doing everything up to code. Gross. I know. But then at that point, your hidden gem secret treasure is going to be exposed because it's going to be logged and it's going to be known about. That's pretty cool. So let's talk about the superstitions. Awesome. I have read some stuff. I have heard some stuff. I don't know what's true, but what everything that I've heard and read is absolutely fascinating. And you've been out in the superstitions yourself. So I'm going to attach some links to stories about the superstitions and why they're called that. Mm -hmm. But I'll give one example that I remember from reading it. And uh, There would be people that would go, even within the past decade, that would go into the superstitions and never come out, never be found, or people that would go in there and they would find them, but they would only find... Uh, their body or their clothing, uh, but no head, like their head would be missing and they would find just the rest of them or they would find no corpse at all, but just their belongings, their backpack, their clothes, everything. So what has your experience been like in the superstitions? Well, I spend a lot of time throughout the eastern, northern, and central superstition mountains, and that's pretty much like the epicenter of all the legends, lore, and ghost stories of the superstition mountains. And uh, a lot of people, when they see the superstition mountains, they see the western border of what um, borders Mesa and Apache Junction, and that's just part of the mountain. Superstition mountains is like a range of mountains. And there's so many gorgeous tributary canyons in there. There's epic waterfalls. There's swimming holes that are bigger than a lot of these swimming pools in the valley. And no one goes there. And so I have like my own little gardens of Eden in the Superstition Mountains that I go to. And But it is steeped in a very dark history. There's been over 600 deaths in the Superstition Mountains from the 1860s to the present. There's too many missing person cases to count. Um, there's one that I would like to do a shout out about. It's um, Kaiman Welsh in 2020 went missing into the Superstition Mountains. And like many of the missing person cases that happened in the Superstition Mountains and elsewhere, he left his phone in the car with his uncle, his keys, cell phone, everything. He was wearing black combat army boots, kind of like Vietnam era jungle boots. Um, black clothing. He was wearing a black Ghostbusters t-shirt. He hiked to the top of this hill next to a parking lot to overlook Weaver's Needle and look off to the west to watch the sunset. And then his uncle saw him walk past the crest of the hill, descend out of sight, never seen again. There's no trace, nothing. And he's never been found. There's been no contact to the family. It's just just vanished. And when I learned about it, I grabbed the owner of Bonehouse Brewery in Fountain Hills and we went out there together because... I love tracking. I just love it. And uh, we went out there looking for him, and I figured since nothing was found, he had to have fallen into an old mine shaft from the 1900s or the early or the late 1800s, early 1900s, even up until the 1960s. Seems like you'd have to really try to do that, though. Yeah, unless you wanted to disappear. I mean, why was he wearing all black? I don't know. And this was like in in late August, too. Yeah. Hmm. So, and they never found him, and the family is still, um like broken with unanswered questions. Yeah. That's gotta be so tough. Yeah. So it's very, very sad. And sometimes I go out there just to follow in the footsteps of them. And to me, it's very hard to get lost in the superstition mountains or any mountain range, just because I have, I was born with the gift of terrain association, but out there you'll run into, into people no matter where you go. If you go to Weaver's needle or Labarge Canyon or siphon draw or the iron flats or, um, Black Mesa or Geronimo's Head, you're going to run into a, a hippie, a hiker. You're going to run into a yoga instructor, a Boy Scout troop. You know, you're going to run into people. And the fact that he just vanished is just so intriguing to me. So that brings up the other aspect of the superstition and why it has that name is that there's some lore about there being a, a portal or like a, a gravity well or some way to disappear 
without a trace. And I don't know what another word for it would be other than portal. Mm-hmm. But there's um, is there extraterrestrial activity out there or like what people report as seeing stuff like that? Um, I've heard a lot of prospectors in the past talk about seeing UFOs in the Superstition Mountains. I, I have not. I spent over 100 nights out there alone, and sometimes it'd be a week-long trip, two-week-long trip. And uh, I look up at the stars an awful lot. There's beautiful shooting stars out there. Um, in Massacre Grounds, that's where I've had a lot of my paranormal activity happen. And it's not a far walk from where you can park at the Lost Dutchman State Park or First Water Trailhead. Um, but I, I can't say as to the the UFO aspect. Tell me about your paranormal stuff. So I was camping at a place that is nicknamed Trace Castillos. It's like three spires that are in the middle of Massacre Grounds. And I'm on this ledge because I love to camp on ledges because only people and animals have one way to approach you. And it's very easy to defend those places. And I don't run into a lot of problems when it comes to people and animals, but I do occasionally. And I was, I had a little fire going and I'm just like singing to myself because I didn't have any playlists on my cell phone. This was before all of that got popular and a rock just hits the wall above me and then collapses next to me. And I look out and my eyes adjust away from the firelight into the moonlight of the desert in front of me. And there's a silhouette of a person out there. And he's just standing there. How far? Maybe about 50 yards. Over the ledge? Yeah, over the ledge down into, because I'm about 30 feet up. Okay. And he's down in the desert floor below me, and he's about 50 yards away from my ledge. And he's just standing there, and I'm just like, hey, if you're lost or something, you need help, like, come on up. I got food, I got water, I got cigars, because I'm a cigar guy. And um, he just stood there. I'm thinking, well, that's rude. <laughs> like, you okay, man? And uh, I'm like, well, if if I can't help you, like, do you need a flashlight? Because you're standing in the dark and nothing happened. No that, response. No response. No, so, mo- no movement. Yeah, just no movement, just standing there. And I'm like, all right. So I just kind of go back to what I'm doing. But I just get my backpack because my backpack is on top of my pistol. And I just put my pistol on top of my bag. And I just go back to what I'm doing. And then another rock gets thrown. And that's when I'm just like, okay, this is this is over now. And so I get down from my ledge and when I get down from the ledge, I notice that he's not where he was before. He's about 80 yards over here by another group of boulders. And this is a cat claw field. If you know what cat claw is, it's this plant that has little thorns on it that are curved like a cat's claw. And they make a horrible noise when you're going through them because it grabs your clothing and stuff. And if you're wearing nylon or something like that, it's really loud. And it, it cuts you. It goes through your clothes. And you would hear someone traveling through that cat claw field 80 yards over to that group of boulders, and it was silent. I never heard anything. And now he's over there. And so I'm like, I'm just going to come to you because what you're doing is really creepy. You need to leave me alone. And so I go over to him, and I make my way, trudge my way through the cat claw field. And as soon as I get close, he goes around the group of boulders to the right and then I go to the left you saw him move at that I point? saw him move I could see the silhouette and the light moving between his legs but you couldn't hear anything couldn't hear and I didn't notice it at the time like when I was actually trying to corner this person like confront them but there was no footsteps like I could see his foot feet moving he was kind of like jaunting so it, it appears as if you're walking if you're watching somebody walk they bounce up and down a little bit yeah so it looked like that mm-hmm and you can see the like the darkness of his legs and the moonlight. Like you can see that his legs are moving. And he goes around to the right. I go around to the left and I'm kind of sprinting it to the left. And when I go around to the left, no one meets me. And I'm then I just kind of run circles around this boulder. And then I just turn on I go back to my camp, grab my flashlight, come back, and then there's there's no tracks but my own. And also there was no cicadas. There was no crickets. There was no grasshoppers. It was just silence. Wow. So that's that's Massacre Grounds. Massacre Grounds. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to guess, but correct me. Do you, you believe in 
ghosts and and spirits and things like that based on these experiences? I do. I do. Did Um, you before that? Before that moment, I did because of a separate moment that occurred um, in the same area where I found the Spanish coins. This wasn't... Oh, um, going back to the coins. After I found those coins, I only planned to be there for five days. I ended up staying 58 days and 57 nights. That's what that story is. That's the story. I got to know about that. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, I don't know. We kind of like jumping around. Yeah, here. we can jump back and forth. That's cool. Yeah. So um, I spent, uh, yeah, when I found the first coin and then I found another coin, um, I realized there's more here than what meets the eye. And I didn't stay five days. I stayed 58 days. Funny thing is I had a girlfriend when I went into those mountains and I was single when I came back out. Yeah, not surprising. <laughs> not surprising. <laughs> yeah. And she didn't support your habit? No, she thought I just ditched her or whatever, but she didn't believe my story. And when I put stuff in her hand, she would she didn't want to hear it. And this was like, oh, I had man. a Nokia phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was before the Razor came out and all that. Um, but every night when I was in camp, I would, in the firelight, have my journal out and I would be drawing where I found new artifacts that day in reference to where I found artifacts the, pre- the previous day and the previous week. And over time, during those 58 days, 57 nights, I put together this nerdy CSI of what the Spanish camp looked like, where their tents were, where their horses were picketed, where they had three campfires set up, and where the coins were in a line, and then where the stone arrowhead points were found in the camp. You did this all based off of where you found specific artifacts. That's right. That's awesome. Do you still have a picture of that? No. My ex-wife took that. Oh, man. Yeah, I was married to a cop. She was a police officer, and she took that. Yeah. Harsh. Dirty cop. Harsh. (laughs) (laughs) But um, in that same area, different time frame. This was... um, Where you found the coins. Yeah, where I found the coins. This was about a mile to the west that this ghost story occurred. So I was camped at the Salt River, and this is still on that private cattle ranch, and this was in, during the middle of the summer again, and a tempest set in. So this is when like that white wall of our monsoons just comes out of nowhere and just crashes into you. Well, I'm in a canyon, and my tent's already set up. I'm, I have a fire going. I'm trying to cook dinner, and the storm hits, and I'm trying to grab my tent because it, it, the, the wind went under my tent and pulled it up, and the stakes went with it. And I'm trying oh, wow. to catch my tent. And I'm fighting with the wind, and then I finally start breaking down the tent, and I'm forcing it into my bag, and the wind's blowing sideways, the rain's coming in sideways, and it's just, the rain almost hurts. And I I know that there's a ruin on the cattle ranch about a mile and a half north of me. (sighs) And I've used it before to get out of the the wind in the wintertime, because the rancher actually brought me to the attention of that ruin, because during bad snowstorms, He's used that Indian ruin as a corral for his livestock. Hmm. And he's like, if you need to escape the weather out there, go to that place. And so that's what I did. Cool. But during the storm, it was towards the end of the day when it hit. And so I put everything into my bag and I have to hike up this steep embankment to get to the top of this canyon. By the time I get to the top of this canyon to the ridgeline, it's nighttime and the rain's still coming down hard. And you still have a mile to go. Yeah, just, just about a mile. And my flashlight doesn't work because it's saturated by the water. My cell phone, my digital camera, I have no light source that works because everything's just ruined from the water. But what I used was the illumination of the lightning strikes in the valley. Every time lightning struck, it illuminated this valley. And in this mountain range, there's thousands of these little valleys inside of, on, like on top of canyons and everything. It's Kind of a strange place. The Superstition Mountains has those too, but not as many. And every lightning flash, it would illuminate this valley. And I would go around a mesquite tree, around this like uh, Palo Verde or some creosote bushes. And I'd stop and wait for the next flash because I'm looking for a certain ridge line. It took me about an hour to get there. By the time I get there, by traveling through lightning flashes, which is like stop and go, like red light, green light. I collapse behind the wall and it stops the wind, which is great. And I'm exhausted. Soaked. Yeah, soaked. And even though this is the summertime, the wind is blowing and I'm cold. So I set up my tent inside the ruin and I 
throw my blanket inside. It was a wool blanket. It's soaking wet and I don't care. And I throw my pack in there and my pack is my pillow. And I just kind of lay on top of the blanket and I just die. I'm just exhausted and I'm done. And then I wake up to something punching me in the face. Yeah. What? So I fall asleep. I wake up. Like if I were to punch you in the face? Yeah. Like something violently struck my face and it hit my left cheek. And I look over and I can see all five fingers impressing through the nylon of the tent and then backing away. Now let's reflect on the situation. So like an open hand pushing on the outside of a tent while you're inside it? Yeah. Like it. something just literally smacked my tent and it hit my face and I'm alone. It's the middle of the night. I just went through a thunderstorm to get to this Indian ruin. The cattle rancher said no one is supposed to be out there except for me. And someone just punched me in the face. I did what I thought any normal person would do. I pulled out my revolver, which was a SIG three feet. It was a SIG. I'm sorry, not a SIG. It was a Ruger Blackhawk 357 Magnum. And I pulled it, cocked it, and I fired point blank against the tent where that hand was. And the uh, muzzle velocity of that was so extreme at point blank, it caught the tent on fire. No joke. Good thing it's rainy. Right? And I unzip the tent. I get out. And I cock the pistol one more time at where someone should be standing. And there's no one there. And I'm in the middle of an Indian ruin. The storm has moved off. It's still kind of sprinkling. And as I'm looking around the ruin, the only light that's illuminating is the flames from the tent behind me burning. And there's only one intact room left in this Indian ruin. The rest of it's crumbled away, lost to time. And there's one intact room with a doorway left. And as I do a complete 360 looking for this person, I'm facing the doorway now. The tent has burnt out, the flames are gone, and as the flames are gone, there's no more light. From inside that room, you heard this. And I didn't go to sleep again that night. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't go to sleep probably for a few nights. Yeah. That's horrifying. Before that moment, I didn't believe in anything. I didn't believe in religion or God. I didn't believe in believing. But... (laughs) In that moment, I realized there is some paranormal out there, and it's real, and a bullet doesn't do anything. Wow. Yeah. So what did you do in that moment? Did you scream at it? Did you run? Did you shoot another shot? I think I said, you stay there, and I'll stay here. And then I just sat there. I just kind of like put like my knees and my chest and my arms around my knees, and I just sat there. And I could hear what sounded like muffled footsteps going around the ruin. Not inside the ruin, but as if it was walking on the outside of the walls. And you were still inside the ruin? I was still inside the ruin. How many rooms are in this place? It would have been about 30 rooms. Oh, wow. It's big. It was big. It's about, uh, I would say, an acre. Oh, wow. It's a pretty big ruin. Okay. And it's on deeded land, which is private property. So um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to sleep in the Indian ruins. Yeah. But uh, it's very haunted. I call it Hilltop Ruins. And trying to convince my girlfriend to go stay there one night during Halloween. <laughs> she uh, she she might do it. I don't know. What's the what's the roof like? Because you got out of the wind and the rain. Mm-hmm. What's the roof made of? The roof is made of swirl ribs. So okay, if you go inside that room, it's small. It's kind of like a an apartment kitchen. It's like that's how small the room is. But if you look at the ceiling, it's swirl ribs that were cut in half. So they're laid down flat with the crescent shape facing up, mm-hmm. and then that's where the mud was pressed. And so it's kind of like an arch system to yeah. help distribute the weight. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's survived from 800 years ago till now. 800? It's 800 years old? Yeah. How do you know that? It's from the pottery that you find in uh, tree ring dating, which is called cryodentral, cryodentrology? I could be wrong. Okay. Cryodentrology. Um, the rancher brought out an archaeologist to do tree ring dating on the site because that's not the only ruin on his deeded land. He has a 300-room ruin very close to his property. And then he has a cliff ruin next to his property. He has a, a ruin which a fight took place between the Tonto Apache and U.S. soldiers out of Fort Apache on his property. And uh, a lot of people go to that ruin. How big is this property? Is it? It's a, th- it's a 33 square mile cattle ranch. Okay, 33 square miles. Yeah. Okay. That's a scary experience. So mm-hmm. let me think about that for a second. 
Yeah, that's my creepiest ghost story that I got. That's pretty rough, man. Yeah, and I was alone. Yeah. So, and then you continued to go out alone after that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm usually a friend that people have to be in the mood for to hang out with. Like when they watch Pirates of the Caribbean or a western or something like that, they want to go experience some kind of that stuff. But what I deal with every every time I go out is I deal with. Re- it's a common fact of life. There's gnats, there's mosquitoes, there's rattlesnakes, there's bugs, there's centipedes, there's people, there's going to be mountain lions, bobcats, javelina, coyotes every night, you know, and a lot of people don't handle the reality of it. They like the romanticism, the yeah. idea of it. Yeah, people want the fun, exciting experience with something to take home, but you don't want the work that it takes to get there. Exactly. But yeah. going through that pain and misery, just like anything in life, hard work pays off. Wow. Yeah. Are there any, are there little, are there any other kind of experiences like that that you've had? Like, oh, well, let's go back to the whistle. Yeah. What do you know about the whistle? So, I don't know much about the whistle. I I will never forget that whistle. When I was in um, Camp Casey, South Korea, and I got to see my barracks for the first time, I was 22 years old. I was in Bravo 29 and uh, Camp Casey. Yeah, I was at Camp Casey, and uh, I leaned over the balcony. I was on the top floor of my barracks, and uh, I noticed it echoed, and I did that that whistle. And I know that my platoon was actually um, doing training when I arrived in South Korea. Before I was assigned to my platoon, uh, my whole company was out at a place called Rod Range, and it was winter time. Um, and I knew I was alone in the barracks except for uh, staff duty down downstairs. And I whistled, and I heard what sounded like uh, a door handle jiggling down the hallway. And uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know. But when I usually when I whistle like that now, it's because I'm nervous. Interesting. Yeah. Now, when you heard that whistle, that was post military. That was pre-military. 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 Okay, so when did you? How old were you when you went out to this uh, ranch? Um. I would have, this was 2005. 2005 was my 58 days, 57 nights. 18. I was 20. You were 20? I was 20. Okay, and then you went into the military at what age? 22. 22, and, and okay, gotcha. And then after the military, you continued doing these excursions. Oh, yeah, vigorously. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the whistle thing, I have heard about, uh, I've heard some native lore of like skinwalkers whistling. Oh man, yes, yeah, yeah. What do you know about skinwalkers? I'm sure you've researched this stuff plenty. Oh yes, I'm on the Navajo reservation every week. Cool. So I have a Spanish Mustang that I purchased in April. I used to work on the Turquoise Ranch in the Twin Arrow Cattle Company for five years, and um, the ranch sold to a new individual who still allows access for myself and the former ranch foreman to go out there and it's a 55 square mile cattle ranch. And so there's all kinds of petroglyphs, there's ruins, there's a spring, which has been used from, as far as I know, the dawn of time until today. Um, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado had captains that went that way and had to have watered in that canyon, the Conquistador Espejo. Um, the U.S. soldiers during the Civil War when they brought camels over, they watered in Spring Canyon, in that canyon. Hmm. And... Uh, the skinwalkers is a very interesting topic. Yeah. Now, I had a skinwalker encounter, and it's actually much closer to us right now than the Navajo Reservation. Where? Watson Lake. Really? I, this was 2015, and I was paddleboarding with my ex-girlfriend, and it was myself, my ex-girlfriend Kay, and her friend Alex, which is a girl, um, Alexandria, and... We were, there's two docks, kind of. There's the the dock where everyone fishes off of. You can take boats to it. There's a smaller one on the north end, closer towards the dam, um, which is the original one from like 1920. And we were paddle boarding around Watson Lake, waiting for some of Alex's friends to arrive. And as we're getting closer to the northern ramp, we go through this defile of boulders. And it's like, you know, decomposing granite. And there's a large boulder in front of us about 100 yards away, maybe, maybe 100 yards away. And there's a man squatting down, looking at us. And the sun is starting to, it's starting to set. So he's just a silhouette. Hmm. 
and his right knee is up, his left knee is down. And I think I I called out to him saying hello and I just waved. And he didn't wave back. And then as we're getting closer cuz we're just we're not really paddling anymore, we're just kind of coasting in the water. And all of a sudden I look over at Kay and then I look back up and it's a dog now. It looks like a Rottweiler. It's just a black silhouette of a dog. You can see all four legs. You can see the head. You can see the mouth open panting. You can see the tail kind of wagging. And my ex is like, that was a man. And I'm like, yes, that was a man. And then we're like, well, maybe the dog was just standing in a way that it looked like a man. Maybe it was sitting down in a way that it looked like a man. And mm. that's what we agreed on. And Alex was like, yeah, let's just say that. Let's just, <laughs> let's say that. It was, it was the dog. Mm. And then just kind of like water going from like, a glass into a bowl. It just took a different shape. Like it, it just moved. You watched it. If you going watched from a, it change again. It went from a dog into this great big bird, kind of like a swan. It just moved. Like it wasn't like a transition, like in Hollywood movies. It just, it was literally like pouring water from a glass into a bowl. It's the same object in yeah. a different shape. It's, mm-hmm. it, it was. I don't think Hollywood could ever replicate that. And it was this big bird, and it started flapping its wings. And then that's when my ex-girlfriend, she's like, we need to leave now. And we're still getting closer to this thing. And then it moved backwards. It went from a bird back into the dog, back into the man who's squatting down, and then the man stands up. And that's when my ex screamed. But it was an inhale scream. Kind of like when you're about to see a child fall off a stool. You have that... (gasps) But it echoed through the granite. Oh, wow. And I'm trying to, like, grab her paddleboard to, like, console her. And I look back up, and the man is gone. Just disappeared? Just disappeared. And then we notice that once he's disappeared, we can hear people playing at the dock now. We can hear the highway, which is right next to Watson But prior to that, you couldn't. You couldn't. So, like, when paranormal activity happens, you were talking about vortexes and stuff? Yeah. I think there's, like, a snow globe effect where it just kind of traps you in that moment. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Now it's it's you're seeing only the silhouette each time it changes form. That's right. Okay. So you couldn't tell like what the skin color of the man was or whether or not he was wearing clothes or anything? No. Just the silhouette of a man. And <laughs> when I'm on the reservation, um, I get to meet a lot of old time ranchers out there who have met a lot of very influential people from the reservation and people who have settled that land for hundreds of years. And if you see a coyote, it's supposed to be a bad sign. The the direction the coyote comes from also depicts what the message that coyote is bringing you is supposed to mean. Yeah. I've heard a lot about that stuff with with native culture Mm -hmm. and uh, especially in association with ravens. Have you had any experiences with ravens like that? Good experiences. The Navajo called the raven gogi. And um, they're just messengers Kind of like the Vikings in a way. They just watch and they just relay messages and stuff. Um, Just from me being out in the desert so much, I've learned that you can make friends with ravens, with shiny objects and peanuts and stuff like that. If you camp in the same place over a long period of time or go out every single weekend, they get to recognize your vehicle. And if you leave peanuts for them or stuff like that, they get closer and closer. You can have raven friends. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I would like to do that. I like ravens. I've had some weird experiences with ravens. Not really bad, but just like, What was that? Now, the scary thing, like the the one thing that, especially the Navajo, the Diné, um, preach about is owls. Yeah, I had, um, I've had some times where I was, I was invited to go sit in the Navajo peyote peyote ceremony in their teepee Mm -hmm. up there by Chinle. I love Chinle. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, and, and I was like, they say to bring this, bring that, bring an offering for the guy running the ceremony. So I bring like a jar of honey and some tobacco, stuff like that. Yeah. And they like that. And... Um, and I asked the guy who was kind of my liaison, I was like, what about this? Can I bring this, this raven feather? And he's like, oh no, don't bring that. They don't like those. They don't like the ravens. There's a bad sign. Same with owls. Never bring an owl feather into a, a teepee ceremony. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad juju. It's, it's bad luck. It, it brings about bad medicine and it, it could affect the events of that evening or the events of the next week. Um, yeah. And, and the Navajos, like if, if a rattlesnake crosses their path, they have to do a ceremony. Hmm. 
What is that ceremony? Do you know? Um, it's very expensive. There's usually like butchering a sheep involved, and it costs a lot of money because they have to pay for the medicine man to drop what he's doing to come out to you and then cleanse you of the negative entity that attached itself to you by seeing that rattlesnake. Hmm. So how does belief play a factor into this? Because I don't know. I guess in my experience, like you can only get a negative entity attached to you if you believe that that's possible. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's just kind of my perspective of it. But that's really interesting. It, have you ever had anything like that happen where you're like, oh, yeah, that's definitely a thing? Like, what do you mean? Like with uh... like uh, the coyote as a negative sign or something negative for a week related to owls or even the rattlesnake crossing your path. A few nights ago, I was I spent all day with my horse. Um, we're doing the garrocha, which is like a Spanish vaquero way of herding cattle. It's like a dance with your horse. You're using a, a lance. And uh, spent all day. It was day one of um, desensitizing my horse to the lance. We're using a PVC pipe as the lance. And uh, just getting him used to trotting in a circle on his own. Because he's, you know, I'm still training him. He was an unbroke Mustang before this. And um, my good friends, Dave and Bev, who were the ranch foremans for the cattle ranch for years and years, um, their help, they helped me break the horse through their instruction and my blood, sweat, and tears. So I did all the bucking, the riding out through the bucking and all that kind of stuff, the skittish um, explosions with that horse. Um, but after that, I went to a place and I set up camp and I, we were doing an experiment with something and like a, you can call it like research and development with, with something which is really cool. I'll play a video of it for you and our recording. And after they left, the sun had already set and it's nighttime now. And when they left, three packs of coyotes came to my camp. And I had to get them away. Normally, three packs of coyotes never descend on a camp. They're so skittish. Mm -hmm. You could walk through the desert at night, which I love to do under the moonlight. It's like an ancient ambiance. Surreal. It is so surreal. It's beautiful. And uh, like going through the desert and the lightning flashes at night, that's what forged my love of hiking through the desert at night because it made you feel like you were back in that time period. Yeah. And so when the full moon is out or just a half moon walking through the desert, I just love it. Well, it's funny. It's, you're talking about a time period, but it's right now. Yeah. It's just the disconnection from the devices. That's right. When you tap into being a part of that land, you recognize I'm a part of this. Yeah. Then you feel that you're a part of it in that way. And that's a really good way to do it. Yeah. Like, uh, going back just to relate to what you just said when I, when I moved to Arizona in 1993 cuz I'm a native Texan I'm actually a Texas boy and I was born in Amarillo when my family moved to Arizona we moved to Gilbert in 1993 and my father got religiously involved with gold prospecting the moment we got here Quigley Down Under had just come out and so we're all about the desert and stuff and great movie yeah I wanted to be Quigley so bad <laughs> and uh We joined this gold prospecting group for a while. We went with them, and then um, we went to Wickenburg, North Wickenburg, to a place called Stanton and Rich Hill. I know Rich Hill. Yeah, there's an old gold, like Wild West ghost town right next to Rich Hill, which is Stanton. And I think the brothel was still standing. There's a couple of buildings that were still standing. There's like a gold prospector snowbird camp right there kind of thing where you can park RVs and camp. and. Hmm. But near that place, there was a group of people um, gathered. And my father said, you see that old man? You need to go with that old man. Walk with him. And this man was like 104. This was 1993. Whoa. And his family is helping this, this elderly man walk. And they drove to a park next to some boulders and some cat claw. And we walked to a small stone grave. It looked like the size of your coffee table. And after the family was doing their conversations and, you know, he was sharing stories and stuff like that. I'm standing in the back. I can't really hear him. But towards the end of their conversations, I asked the old man, who's in the grave? And he said, that's my father. He was killed here by Apaches when I was in my mother's stomach. He was 104. This was 1993. In that moment, I realized history is not far away. 
So 1889, that guy was born. Yeah. And you got to talk to him. I did. Whoa. My father said, you'll never get this experience ever again in your life. And I never have. That's right. So it was that moment that really hooked me onto history. Mm. My addiction for research, uncovering these places that are lost to time, and getting to relearn the events that occurred in those places and to be able to pull out artifacts from the ground that were lost in those places to link those stories together. That's my passion. That's my addiction. That is awesome. And I love putting those on display and sharing the stories lost yeah. to time. Yeah. That's beautiful. I think, I think Rich Hill is privately owned now. I think it's, is it, it could be the Weaver mining district or I, I think it used to be GPAA owned it. And then I think Roadrunner Prospecting Club owned part of it. I don't know who owns it now. I know a guy who is friends with the owner, apparently. I don't know this guy well, so I can't really vouch for that story. But that's what I'm told. And um, you're familiar, I assume, with Potato Patch? I am, yeah, yeah. Do yeah. you know the story of that? Yeah, they were finding gold nuggets the size of potatoes. That's what they say. Do you think that's true? I think so. That was... Um, I think it was like a, a Mexican ranch hand or a Mexican like pack packer or something like that is what found the gold nugget on top of Rich Hill when he was trying to get a mule that escaped. That's the mm -hmm. story I heard. Yeah. Um, and I totally believe that gold nuggets were that size. Size of potatoes, man. That's crazy. Yeah. That's good stuff. And Rich Hill's pretty far away from Potato Patch. It is like it's, twenty miles or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you estimate the value of certain things like the coins or, you know, um, an arrowhead or whatever? I usually try to match things. Like just as soon as I find something, once I get back into cell reception, I'll just start Googling what clues this artifact can give me. If there's any markings on it, if there's a letter on it or a date on it, I'll just type in what the object looks like, what markings are on it. And then I'll usually be able to find a match. And if I can't find a match, I'll reach out to people that, dabble in those kinds of things and they can give me a rough estimate to it and then i'll usually take them back to texas there's an antiquity dealer in texas who deals with an awful lot of stuff um all my maps i get from this guy all my old documents and old books from like the 16 and 1700s i get from this one individual in salado texas and he appraises them for me and he says, I got a buyer for this one. I got a buyer for this one. I got a buyer for this one. Or if you don't want that, I know the perfect place we can put it on display. And that's how I do things. So when you put something on display, do you get paid for that or are they leasing it from you or anything? Usually they'll lease it from you. Um, or kind of like consignment without pay. Like they'll just like have it on display for as long as you want it to be there. But it's still yours. You can come grab it whenever that it, exactly. consignment is over with. Yeah. Interesting. So you ever make it out to the Antiques Roadshow? No, no. <laughs> That'd be fun, though. Yeah, I bet. Um, is there any kind of a database for those, um, for that type of information for artifacts? I'm sure there's got to be some database you can look this stuff up in, right? Um, there's a lot of books and um, archival information on like the Spanish coins. Okay, so it'd be by type of artifact. That's right. Got it. Yeah. All right, so this 58 days that you were in the wilderness by yourself, like, where did you get water? Where did you get food? Oh, man. How to, I, like, how do you... I've gone out into the wilderness for short stints, but how do you go 58 days by yourself? Well, before the 58 days, I had done four different desert survival courses. Two of them were just one-day events that were done through a community college when I was in high school, and I, did, I took a four-day course... Um, over by Superstition Springs Mall at the, I think that mall's still open. I don't know. It's way, it's like South Mesa or East Mesa? Yeah, it's about East Mesa. Yeah. And then there was an individual, he was a Chiricahua Apache. He, his name was David Fox, and he was from San Carlos. He took me to Six Shooter Canyon, which is over by Globe, and we spent a couple of weeks, and he taught me a lot of stuff out there. Six Shooter Canyon is a gold producing area by itself. There's a lot of gold claims over there, but the road back then was horrible. I thought we were going to flip over the edge of this Canyon. I hope the road's better now, but, um, those four different courses I took kind of were like just the beginning lessons. And then when I was started finding Spanish silver coins, 
I thought to myself, well, I'm not going home. I'm going to stay another day. And then I stayed another day and another day. And then I'm like, well, I brought five days worth of food. I'm going to go hunting. And so I had a small game permit. So I just jackrabbits, rattlesnakes, and I set up a lot of Paiute deadfalls. What kind of a gun did you use to hunt? That was a Ruger Blackhawk 357 Magnum. Okay. But you I shot put... rabbits with that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. many rabbits did you have to shoot for a meal? Um, I can make one jackrabbit, because out there the jackrabbits were almost the size of coyotes. And so I can make one dra- jackrabbit last about three days. Really? Yeah. Holy crap. And I learned that I didn't have to use a knife to dress it. I just used a stick to poke a hole, and then like I could I just it. do the rest from there. Yeah. And uh, I used... A lot of prickly pear pads, prickly pear fruits, choya fruits. There's a type of choya that tastes like okra that I would just throw on the fire to burn all the glockids off and the thorns. And I would just chop it up and just eat it like okra. Um, I used the cattail reed, the base of it, and then the root of it, which is just loaded with starch. And I made a lot of Paiute deadfalls, so I ate a lot of squirrels, pack rats, kangaroo rats. I ate a lot of rattlesnakes, a lot of western diamondbacks. I don't have thank a good you. recipe for thank those, you. but I just eat them. That's would, a civil service, really. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, some green Mojaves. There were some black tail rattlesnakes. Green Mojaves? Is that a type of snake? It, well, it's just a Mojave rattlesnake, but it just happens to be the color of green. Okay. And they're just agitated little effers. Are they venomous? They're the most venomous that we have. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. And they fast? I can't say they were fast. I've seen a... A timber rattler that was faster than a Mojave, but um, either way, I don't like them. Yeah, the the rattlesnakes. Most of what I was hunting rattlesnake wise were about three to five feet long. Wow! And that was a lot of meat. I made a lot of stews and stuff, and I ended up making a fire pit where I cooked on a flat rock Mm because I didn't have a frying pan or anything. I had a small stainless steel one quart cup that I boiled everything in. That's why I made stew in. But I had a crescent fire pit with a flat rock on the front of the crescent. So the embers and the flames would hit the base of that rock. And that's what I cooked on as like a frying pan. Like a griddle. Yeah. Awesome. And the back end of it is where the smoke would come out and I would have a rock on top of that. So the smoke would go over the food and I would have like a little teepee kind of thing above it. And that's where I would hang meat to dry and to, to dehydrate. So I'd be cooking meat while I'm jerking meat too. That's awesome. And um, I had a very regimented day. I would start off at dawn. And in the summertime, because this is like late July into early September that I was out there for. And I would wake up at dawn. Usually when the birds start chirping and the sunlight wakes you up. I would start breakfast, drink a quart of water. And then I would go to my site and I would start excavating. I would start digging, metal detecting, and there was so much iron artifacts. I just would use the metal detector once, put it down and just start digging with my hands. And I ended up making a screen out of cattail leaves. Those long leaves, I just braided them together, kind of like a mat, and I just made a screen. So I would just throw dirt on it and just screen it out. Artifact, artifact, throw dirt on it, artifact, artifact. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I was in the best shape of my life on the cactus and rabbit diet going up and down those hills. I can imagine. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, and uh, you said a Paiute A Paiute deadfall. deadfall. What is that? It's a, it's like a snare trap. It's through, you use physics, you use a couple of sticks and a flat rock, which is, it weighs enough that it once it collapses, it will be able to um, kill a small rodent. Okay. Yeah, you can make them as big as you want, but... um, Big as you can lift, really. Exactly. And uh, you're going to bloody your hands in the beginning once you're trying to learn this Paiute deadfall because you're going to mess up the balance of it and the rock's going to come and hit your hands. But once you figure it out, it's so easy. It took me about 20 minutes to figure it out because it had been a couple of years since I had made one in the survival courses. And this 58 days is really where I went from cutting my teeth to thriving, learning what didn't work what really worked, what was practical, not practical. The Paiute deadfall was a huge like asset on my side. And I would set them out 100 yards in every direction, and then 100 yards after that. And then when I moved camps, I would just do them all over again. So how is the trap triggered? Um, you would put 
there's a little bait stick. Once you, I wish I had a pipe deadfall with me, I could do a demonstration, but there's a, a little trigger stick and that's your bait stick. And that's what is holding everything together. And you can make it as much of a hair trigger as you want. Oh, wow. And once a rodent touches the bait you put on that stick, it could be a raisin or peanut butter. I used peanut butter. Yeah. Um, that stick moves. It disturbs the balance of that boulder in connection with the sticks, which are connected to the ground. And then the whole thing just disassembles. And then the deadfall falls on the rodent, kills it. And then you go find it dress it, throw it in the pot. Wow. And then I ate a lot of scorpions too. Oh, really? <laughs> They're everywhere. How'd, yeah. you, how'd you prepare them? Oh, pretty pretty savagely. Um, I would just, to make a scorpion edible, all you really do is you get two sticks, you get the scorpion, you just hold the tail down with one stick and you use another stick to just knock off the, the stinger. There's a, kind of like a, um, it's like a bubble on top of the tail where the stinger is. And that's where the, the venom is in the stinger. And you just knock that off. And then all you have is a really tiny little crab. Okay. And so it'll pinch you and stuff. It doesn't really hurt, but I found a coat hanger out there, a metal coat hanger. And I just would loop like the actual hook onto my belt loop and just like pinch it. And I would take scorpions when I was out during the day and I would just knock the stinger off of them and then throw them on this coat hanger. And then at night I would just hang like it over a, the fire. So like a kebab, you'd collect them by sticking them onto the kebab. Exactly. Then pull it off your belt loop and set it over the fire at the end of the day. I would have about 20 a day. Wow. Just about 20. They were their bark scorpions. Some were fatter than others. Some were bigger than others, but yeah, those yeah. ones are pretty venomous, right? They are. Yeah. The smaller they are, the more uh, poisonous they are. Yeah. Cause they can't, they don't regulate the amount of venom that they're, um, pushing out that's right okay it's the same with rattlesnakes the younger they are they can't control their venom yeah yeah wow all right so have you ever had any kind of experience out there where you where it's like you're by yourself obviously most of the time and you fall or you almost fall off of something or something almost falls on you Mm -hmm. because if you're out there by yourself and you break an ankle or snap a femur like you're dead you're done that's right um a lot of things can go wrong very quickly yeah um, everything could be going wrong. You could be just listening to tunes on your phone that you have downloaded. And, uh, one wrong step could lead to a broken ankle. And then that fall could lead you to a place where you're ledged up. You can't go up, you can't go down. And then you are in dire straits. So there was one time in the Sierra Ancha mountains, I was going down Coon Creek and there's a, there's a ledge. There was a, a ranch out there that had been burnt by the Apaches in 1872 the house is no longer there um the entire family was killed in this apache raid and it's very close to um fort apache and the apache reservation of san carlos i wanted to see this ranch because i read about it a few times and what maps i did have showed the area which was depicted on the military maps at the time and i was like i want to go see this place so i went down coon creek and there's a reed that's called like horse grass, like horsetail grass. It's this green bamboo kind of stuff. And it is horrible to walk through. It hurts. So I climbed this ledge and I'm about, I don't know, 15 feet up, maybe 18 feet up. And I'm just literally going along this ledge. And then there's an opening coming up to my left and I'm about to be in front of it. And as I'm going in front of it, there's a coiled up, diamondback rattlesnake right there and it had to have been a four footer um its head was probably about the size of a golf ball and it was coiled up sunning itself but as soon as i went in front of it it coiled up and like stood up in like a like a a backward spring motion yeah it was getting ready to strike and so my instinct was to throw myself from the cliff ledge away from it as it was going to strike and it made the motion to strike as i threw myself off the cliff i landed into the the reeds and my back hit a boulder my camel back exploded and i laid there for a moment thinking like is this how i die is my back broken and you can still hear that rattlesnake up there just going um and then that was <laughs> yeah the, you're, you'll get those close calls um, no broken bones, no, no broken just bones, just a big fat bruise and no more water. 
Yeah, well, you're in a creek, so there, there's water oh, everywhere. But okay. you were asked about water. There's water holes all over those mountains, especially after the monsoons or during the monsoons. They're like swimming pools. So do you take a life straw or something? I, I used what's called a catadine water filter, and it's like a, just a pump filter. It'll do like 250 or 500 gallons of water. It'll purify. I would boil water sometimes, but it takes 30 minutes to boil water um, to get it to like a rolling boil to make it really drinkable. Then you got to let it cool off. So that's like 40 minutes has passed. It's just easier to take the 10 minutes, the 50 pumps to do one quart. Um, and that's what I did most of the time. But the Salt River's there. There was three canyons that had water pools everywhere. There was two springs. And so I never wanted for water. I never wanted for food. But the thing that made me um, uncomfortable the most was being alone that was the first time in my life i was ever alone and it was day three that i started to break in a way i started to like question the things i've done wrong in life and the people that i missed the most and like you know the friendships i wish it you know wish things had gone a different way Mm -hmm. and stuff like that and then then i just kind of realized that i need to get my head in the right space because you are your biggest asset or your worst enemy out there. Your state of mind determines everything. Hmm. You could have all the best gear in the world, but if you're not in the right frame of mind, you're doomed. Yeah. So um, I started just singing to myself. I didn't have a playlist. I didn't have an MP3 player. I just, I was trying to remember lyrics to songs. I would play green, like I would sing Green Day a lot or yeah. like Rancid. When I'm nervous, I will sing like Ruby Soho. <laughs> Like destination unknown. Okay. When I'm nervous, I will sing that song. I don't know that song. Oh, the nineties. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you're packing, I assume that each different excursion you're going on, you're packing differently. Exactly. For that excursion. But what are some of the non-negotiables that go with you everywhere, no matter what? So excellent footwear. Um, I don't cheap out on gear that I know will cheap out on me. So I don't shop at Walmart. I don't shop at Big Fiverr. Um, we used to have an outdoor store called Popular. Hmm. Um, uh, Manzanita Outfitters bought them out up here. But uh, I don't think Popular is around anymore either. I go to the Hike Shack in downtown Prescott. I'll go to Sportsman's Warehouse. Or I go to REI. And I buy gear that is top quality. I know it's proven. And it's going to be an asset to me instead of going to Walmart, buying hiking boots, not breaking them in and going out hiking with them for the first time. You know exactly what's going to happen. You're going to get blisters. You might roll your ankle. And then you just put yourself in a dangerous situation and the people you're with. Mm -hmm. You're compromising the safety of everybody. So I don't cheap out on gear that's going to cheap out on me. You know they're about to build an IR an REI here right by Sportsman's. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be I'll be there a lot. <laughs> but um I carry good footwear, mm-hmm. good clothing. Um, What's good clothing to you? Um so for being out in the bush. I wear clothing that's going to be comfortable for the environment. Um if it's summertime, like I'll put chacos in my bag, a swimsuit. Because I ran into so many water holes, and at the end of the day, like I'm gonna go swimming. I don't care if the water looks like milk or if it looks like green, as long as the water is not orange or black, I could get in it. Orange and black indicate oh, just certain types s- of bacteria. Total bacteria, okay. flesh eating up amoebas and stuff like that. Really, but green, no. Green, no. Algae is awesome. Algae is a filter. Okay. And um, but um. So, I, so if it's warm, you bring warm clothes, and then if it's hot, you bring breathable, your swimsuit. Mm-hmm. Now, do you do you invest in that stuff that's like um, doesn't get caught? Those clothes that don't get caught on sharp things. I know, like the Cabela's um, brand pants. Most of the clothes I wear is the company that's cool. Um, I think it's K H U L. Okay. Yeah, uh, K K U H L. They're out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and my pants that I have on is from Cool. The Long sleeve shirt I have on is from Cool. They make excellent outdoor clothing. I'm not sponsored by them. I don't know if I could advertise for them, but um, <laughs> I literally wear um, their jackets, their long sleeve shirts, short sleeve shirts. Um, they make top notch quality adventure clothing. Cool. And like with boots, I wear Loa, Loa boots with Vibram soles. Um, when it comes to firearms, 
it's just like with hiking boots. If you buy cheap firearms, they might cheap out on you. Yeah. So you want to buy something that, um, like when you buy a firearm, you should, I advise buying a firearm that you can trust your life with. Would you trust your life with a, with a Taurus? <laughs> I got a story about that. Okay. Okay. So historically I've owned decent handguns and one time I was in a pinch. So I sold my handgun and then, uh, when I got some money again, I picked up, it was a Taurus G3. Yeah. And I had the, the, the G1 before, which was made in Brazil. It was like their standard issue police gun. And, um, and that gun was okay, but I found out after having a son that it didn't have drop protection. And so I was like, okay, I got to get rid of this because if I drop it with a round in the chamber, gun could go off. Yeah. Not happening around a kid. So I got rid of it, got the next model up, or the or two, two new mo- – can't talk today. Or two models later, it was the G3. Yeah. And uh, that thing had drop protection. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll buy this one. It's optics ready. It's tan. It's all cool looking, whatever. I just need a gun. Carried it around for like a year and a half. Never shot it. Mm-hmm. Finally, I had enough money to buy a SIG, which was the gun that I f- discovered I wanted. And so I take both guns out one day. Both of, them, both of them have never been shot. And I put three mags each downrange. And in that, that Taurus, mm-hmm. it jammed every third round. It just wouldn't go into battery? Or... It, w- it wouldn't... Um, or if it like failure to eject, it was failure to eject the round. It was trying to feed the next round, and yeah. that previous shell would get caught in the slide. And that happened every third or fourth round for three mags. Didn't have a single issue with that SIG. So I, was, I still got the Taurus. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I can't give it to anybody in good faith and be like, here, protect yourself. Hear that Taurus? Fix your stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Taurus has really high quality. Well, I don't know about high quality, but apparently they have really good revolvers, really dependable revolvers. I've never tried a Taurus revolver. I got a guy that's a real, real into guns, and he he swears by their revolvers, but says yeah. he'll never own a, a slide gun from them. A buddy of mine had a Taurus, I think it was a Millennium, and every time he would fire it, the magazine would eject. Oh no! <laughs> and we even like ha- we we t- we tied it up to a vice, and we would just pull a trigger, just like with a string. And without having your grip in the wrong place, it would just eject the magazine. And he sent it to him, and I think they, I think they gave him a brand new model of it. But the brand new model of it did the exact same thing. And I've never owned a Taurus before, but I've just seen what other people have yeah. had their experiences with Taurus. Good, good man. Yeah. Uh, so, so that Ruger Blackhawk is that what you carry the three fifty seven Magnum? For a long time, that's what I carried. Um, when I went in, when I enlisted. Um, I joined in December 2007 in Chandler, Arizona, um, to the Army recruiter. I actually went to a Marine Corps recruiter, and they said that the infantry was full, and I believed them. And so I went right next door. And Yeah, what? I know, right? Why would they say that? I don't know. Maybe the recruiter was just lazy and wanted to go home. Yeah, it could be. But, it wouldn't uh, surprise me at all. Yeah, I went to the Army recruiter right next door, and I was like, hey, I want to join the infantry. And he was like, welcome aboard. And then, you know, a month later, I was off at Fort Benning, Georgia, at Sand Hill, and uh, yeah, Echo 119, 31 BCT. So um, yeah, but um, before Three, 31 BCT is that third brigade uh, of it was a technically, th- I think it was third armored division, first infantry battalion. Third third armored division. So 31 BCT, third infantry regiment, first armored division, third infantry regiment. And where is where are they based out of? So I was, I rejoined, so that was just the basic training unit. And then from there, I went to Camp Casey, South Korea. Okay. So that's where you initially got stationed. Yeah. Camp got Casey. It. That was my first duty station Okay, and it was cold. Yeah, <laughs> it was bet. cold. And then from there, I went to Fort Bliss and from Fort Bliss, I bounced around during my time being stationed there, Donna Anna Range, Alamogordo, Las Playas. Um, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for a little bit to learn the ITAS system, which is uh, like a tow missile system. It's a wire guided system, um, anti-vehicle. Is that the same one they shoot out of the Bradleys and the tanks? I think so. When, when I was, when I was trained on it, we, we were training with them stationary on the ground or on Humvees, which on Humvees, it didn't seem very practical. It was very cumbersome on Humvees because you have to reload it. So it's not the tow. It's the tow missile. It's the tow missile, but a different firing platform. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. We had a guy on a range that should not have been in the position he was in, but he shot a tow missile 
on a range in uh, near Fort Stewart, Georgia, and um, he wasn't guiding it. It separated from the wire and it kept going, and they don't know where it went. that wire is. What controls everything? Like yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That's smart. Bad. Smart people. Was it like an LT? Oh no, he was an E five. Oh, the that's poor guy. Yeah, poor and guy. well, he's. You know, same guy. That's an Article 15 right there. At should, least. Should be. Yeah. You'd think. But no, <laughs> he was probably a, a specialist at the time. Got promoted right after that. Oh, man. And then uh, in Iraq, same guy. Uh, <laughs> negligent discharge through the head of a cot in our tent. For those of you who don't know, a negligent discharge is a big no-no. It is a huge no-no. It's like one of the biggest no-nos you can do. You accidentally di- yeah. like shoot your gun. Like, yeah. oops. Besides shot- losing your firearm, having a negligent discharge is like another huge no-no. Yeah, good thing nobody was laying in the cot, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That guy might not have made it out if so. <laughs> Gosh. But yeah. Um, so back to the gear. Uh, so you say good clothing, mm-hmm. high-quality shoes, and now firearm. Yeah, firearm. So I carry a... Um, 